All right, we're in heat roots. There's 11. telling my friend this past week when I was talking to him on my phone that I was starting to get overwhelmed and and uh, stressed out about life a couple you know a couple about a month or so ago and, and just felt like I needed to start sur surrounding myself with men and women of faith and felt like some of the stuff that we're going through as a church we need to learn faith and, and so we turned to Hebrews and Hebrews is you know the Hebrews 11 is known as the Hall of Faith, or the heroes of the faith, the men and women of the faith, the Hall of Fame. And so um, I think it would be good. It's good for us to just take some time to go through each person. And uh, so last week we talked about Abel and Cain and how Abel had a better sacrifice. And this week uh, kind of goes right off of, kind of picks up right where Cain and Abel left off. We're going to talk about Enoch. It says, in Hebrews 11.5, we're actually going to go through 5 and 6 this week. Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him my wife has this uh picture hung up in our church in our bathroom actually well maybe i don't know if it's in there anymore but it used to be and it's a picture of a flower that kind of came up through some rocks and dirt and um and it says bloom where you're planted and this reminds me of kind of like enoch a couple when I, a couple houses ago my parents when we lived in tanawanda my parents had their concrete driveway completely redone because it had plants like that growing through the concrete. And it's always amazing to me when plants grow through concrete because I watched the process of what these guys did to lay this concrete. So what they did was they completely took out all the old concrete and they took it all away. And they dug underneath the grass line like they got all the grass out they dug all that up and then they put this weed blocker down over the entire driveway then they put stone down then they put the wood things around it to, to block out you know the, the, the driveway then they put this concrete in there and we couldn't park on it for like a week or 10 days or something so the concrete set and so the process to not let this happen is amazing. And when a, when, when a plant does break through rock or concrete to come up out of the ground and push up out of it, it's always amazing to me what that plant had to go through and, and the struggle it had just to come up out of the concrete and bloom. And you think about the intense pressure and work it took for that to happen. And in my opinion, this is a spiritual picture of Enoch. And Enoch's not really talked about much in the Bible. But the spiritual landscape that Enoch grew up into, the environment he grew up in, read, Read it in Genesis 4 with me. I want you to understand the spiritual environment, the, the background that Enoch had. So we're going to look at Genesis 4. We're going to pick up kind of at the end of Cain's story. Cain is Enoch's father. We're going to pick up right before uh, Cain 
kills his brother Abel. So verse 8 said, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And here is the environment that Enoch grew up in. Verse 11 says, now you are under a curse. So Enoch was born into a curse. Driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. So Enoch was born into a family of failures that would never succeed at their career and never do well in the area that they wanted to and that they were supposed to. And then it says, you will be a restless wanderer on earth. So Enoch was born into a family of restless wanderers who could never find their place in life. Cade said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. So Enoch was born into a family that was hidden from the presence of God. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Enoch was born into a family full of fear, never knowing who was going to come after him, never knowing the protection and the peace and the presence of God. But the Lord said to him, Not so anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one, would found, no one who found him would kill him. And then 16 says, So Cain went out from the Lord's presence, and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And so Cain or Enoch grew up in a family who literally walked away from God's presence. And then Cain, verse 17, Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, Irad the father of Mehujuel, Mehujuel was the father of Methuselah, Methushael was the father of Lamech, and then Lamech, is quite the character. He married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son named Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wife, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. And if Cain is avenged seven times, let Lamech, Lamech 77 times. And Adam made, Adam made to love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. And here's the end of the chapter. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. You know things are bad when people begin to call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> you don't call on the name of the Lord when things are good, right? Things have to be pretty desperate. There's probably been three or four times when I've called on the name of the Lord because things were really bad. One day I was uh, out at a youth pastor's retreat and there was no cell phone coverage and there was no internet out there. This was like out in the middle of nowhere. It's a trip we would take every year to really unplug. And if you wanted to talk on the phone, you had to go down the driveway up a hill and then you could get cell phone reception. So about once a day, I would make that trek just to check in with Amber. And the second day I was there, I called Amber and she was pregnant with Abram. And she said to me, well, there's a 50-50 chance we could lose Abram. I just got back from the doctors and they told me there's some complications. And they gave me some medicine, and I got to go, you know, lay down for the rest of the week. That's when I called on the name of the Lord. Like, that's when you know things are bad, right? When people are calling on the name of the Lord. And that's the atmosphere that Enoch was born into. That's the environment this guy grew up in. His father was a murderer. He murders his own uncle. He, his father murdered his brother. 
His father was told he would always fail. He wouldn't have any success in what he did. He was a wanderer. He was a fugitive from God. His, walk, his father walked away from the presence of God. This is, the, this is what Enoch was born into. And so when the Bible talks about Enoch being someone who pleased God and having the faith to do that, that's pretty amazing to me. Because... It's not the same environment that we're living in right now. You had Adam and Eve who walked in the garden. And then you had Cain and Abel who were their sons. And Abel, the one who brought the sacrifices that pleased God, was killed by Cain. And so the only two people living on on the earth at that point when Enoch was born was Adam and Eve. And his very father walked away from God. And then things got so bad, things got so bad after a while, that people finally found God and began to call on him. Enoch was born into a curse. Grew up not knowing the presence of God. With a father that hated God. But somehow still had the faith that pleased God. So whatever excuse that we have, whatever environment we were born into, whatever situation we encounter in life, Enoch was right there with us. Maybe your family wasn't saved. Maybe you didn't grow up in the best house. Maybe you had a hard time growing up. Maybe some terrible things happened to you. I don't know what's going on with your family. I don't know what's happened in your life. But Enoch kind of takes away any kind of excuse that we have for not living by faith. And I don't think there's any coincidence in Hebrews 11. You can go back there. That verse 6 is connected to verse 5. I don't think there's any, any, any coincidence that it talks about Enoch in verse 5, and then verse 6 says these things, For by faith it is impossible to please God. And there's two things that I want to zero in on this week in the Word. The first one says, by f- for, um, by f- And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. That's the first thing that Enoch had to come to grips with. He had a father who hated God. He knew he existed, but he hated God. He walked away from him, born into a curse. But no matter the circumstances, no matter the situations around him, no matter the environment around him, Enoch knew in his heart that God existed. And so the Bible the Bible in verse 6 says, for without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And whether you grew up in a Christian home, whether you work in a Christian environment, whether you live in a Christian environment, no matter what, there's a daily decision to believe that God exists. There's a daily decision to believe that He is real, that He is powerful, that He says He can do what He can do, and you believe it. And there's no wavering from that. A lot of times, as we mature in God, a lot of times we become like chameleons. You can become like your environment. You can walk into a church service like this on a Sunday morning or whenever you go, and you can praise God and pray and worship and and be nice and talk to people and have faith. But then Monday you go into your work environment or you go to your friend's house to watch the Bills game or you go to work or you go out with your friends and have fun. You go on vacation and there's a whole other side of you. And a lot of times it's so easy to kind of pick and choose when you're going to allow God to be the biggest priority in your life, when you're going to allow him to really Uh, know that He exists, that He is there, to have faith in Him, to please Him, to live that kind of life. But Enoch, no matter the situation, no matter the people he was surrounded with, no matter how God was talked about or not, had faith. 
One of my favorite snacks as Cracker Jacks as it was Cracker Jacks when I was a kid. Anybody else like Cracker Jacks? Yeah, I used to love them too. They used to be my favorite snack. About four or five years ago, how many of you know like Cracker Jacks has changed? I don't care what people say, but Cracker Jacks got cheap. They got cheap. They got skimpy. I was eating Cracker Jacks years ago, and you know, I opened the box, and what I like about the Cracker Jacks is the peanuts. Anybody else peanut fans in the Cracker Jack box? No? You don't like the peanuts? You like the popcorn better? Oh, my gosh. How, how dare you? Well, I like the peanuts a lot. And so one day I'm eating Cracker Jacks, and when I was a kid, like, it was just as much, it felt like there was just as many peanuts as there were popcorn in there. So I'm eating the Cracker Jacks, and I, I'm, I'm like, waiting to get to the peanuts. And sometimes the peanuts fall to the bottom because they're heavier than the popcorn or whatever. And I get to the bottom of the Cracker Jack box and there's one peanut in there. And the more I ate Cracker Jacks, the more I realized like they're skimping on the peanuts. And I'm like, Cracker Jack, like what's going on, Cracker Jack? And then you always look forward to the prize. I don't care how old you get because a prize is a prize. And then one day I'm eating the Cracker Jacks and I get to the bottom and there was no more prize. They got, they got rid of the prize. I think now it might be like a stupid tattoo or something. And so I lost all faith in Cracker Jacks and I, and I stopped buying them because they only would put like one peanut in there and sometimes there wouldn't be a prize. Yeah. And like most consumers and most customers, there was no evidence that Cracker Jacks could be faithful and could be consistent and could be the go-to snack when I needed a good snack. And so I just stopped buying them. And that's how most of us treat God. If there's no evidence of what you've done for me lately, if there's no evidence of God coming through on a regular basis, if there's no evidence that he's making today just as great as he made yesterday, if, t if, if today seems harder or things don't seem to get easier, we just kind of treat God like customers and consumers and we just kind of walk away from him in maybe not big ways, but little ways. It's little decisions here and there. It's little choices that we make. God is looking for people who um, not just believe in Him, but commit to Him and live for Him and, and, and do the little things in life just as much as we were willing to do the first thing. And the Bible in Revelations talks about forgetting your first love. And it's a lot like a marriage or a relationship. A lot of times in the beginning of a relationship, you go the extra mile, you, you go the extra, you do the extra things to, to show your love. You do the small things that you know the person really uh, would like and appreciate. But the farther along you get into that relationship, the more you stop doing the little things. And so I, I'm, I'm not looking at a group of people in this room who would ever walk away from God. I know you're, you're cemented in that relationship with Him. But I think that when it comes down to really pleasing God, really living by faith, it takes the little things the little commitments. And I think a lot of times we treat God like Cracker Jack cheated its customers. Well, if I just throw one peanut in there, people will be happy. If I just do the bare minimum, that'll be enough. I think Enoch lived completely different. The second thing we can learn from verse 6 with Enoch and what I think Enoch did. It says, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Believing that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. I think the second thing Enoch knew in life is he understood the benefits or the consequences of seeking or not seeking God. 
I didn't either I didn't know about or I forgot about. There's actually a prophecy by Enoch that's recorded in the book of Jude. And I think Enoch knew the consequences of not seeking God. I think he watched it in his family. I think he watched it in his father. I think he saw it in this guy Lamech who bragged about murdering two people. Because I think Enoch knew enough the, about the consequences of not following God. And in Jude 1.14, you don't have to turn there. It's just two verses. I'll read them to you. But listen to this prophecy from Enoch that's recorded in Jude. It says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of, the, of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken about, against him. He said, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and all of the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch, who grew up in a barren and dry and hostile spiritual environment, prophesied about the coming victorious war that God is going to wage on this earth and the upcoming conviction and judgment that he was going to send to this earth. Enoch, this was before Jesus. This was before the law. This was before Israel was even a nation. But this guy foresaw the power and judgment and holiness of God and the, the toll it would take on people who would, did not seek him. I don't, I don't know how he knew that growing up in the environment that he did. I don't know exactly what he did to live the life that he did. But it says, by faith, he pleased God because he walked in a way, number one, that... Um, you know, he, he believed that God existed no matter what people around him said or did. And number two is he knew the consequences. He saw it in his father. He saw it in this guy Lamech. He saw it in the people around him. He saw it in the desperate plea of people calling out to God. And so when you think about Enoch and the life that he lived. When you think about the fact that he grew up in the same environment, same atmosphere that we do, a, a nation, a culture, a people that have no respect for God, people who are living under the curse, people who are murderers, who fail, who sin, who are spiritual wanderers, people who walk away from the presence of God, you see that he grew up and he lived in the same kind of atmosphere we do. Nothing's changed, even since the seventh generation since man was started. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is we now have the ability to come under grace and live under the grace that Jesus affords us because he died on the cross, and it gives us all the more power than Enoch had to live a life that is holy and set apart and different. And it's so much easier for us than it was Enoch to live that life. And so you think about this plant. Like I go back to this plant. And this plant is should be, it's not only a spiritual picture of Enoch's life, but it should be a spiritual picture of your life and my life. It shouldn't make sense that we can bloom in the midst of stone or concrete or rock-hard dirt. That plant shouldn't be there. And we shouldn't be here either. We shouldn't live this kind of life set apart. I was watching the Bills game last Thursday with my family. And I realized, I realized that God is looking for 
people who are just as committed and sold out to the Bills that they are him. There's no evidence, historical or recent, that the Bills will ever win the Super Bowl. But every single year and every single week, people go into those games expecting the Bills to win, right? There's just this hope and this faith in this football team that has no historical data to represent any kind of hope or faith in that team. And God's looking for the same kind of people who don't need historical evidence, who don't need data, who don't need any other reason, only for the simple fact that we have faith in God to do what He says He's going to do and to be where He says He's going to be and to know that at one, one point God is going to come back just like Enoch said He's going to come back with thousands upon thousands of holy people and He's going to inflict judgment and all the knees will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. That's the only thing that we should need to walk in faith. But I feel like we all have our excuses of why we can't fight through the dirt like that. Maybe for you, it's, it's your background. Maybe you constantly use the fact that you, know, you didn't grow up in a Christian home or your parents did something to you or someone said something to you that you don't have the kind of faith it takes to step out in the way that God's called you to. Or maybe when you go to work and you know that you're walking into an environment that's carnal. You know you're walking into an environment that's, that's not a Christian-friendly place. And this is what your work landscape looks like. And you're like, God, how can you expect me to bloom here? How can you expect me to really stand out? How can you expect me to really be a Christian at work? And you seem to fall in line with whatever anyone else is doing. Or maybe you see your neighborhood this way. It's dry. Maybe you see your school that way. You're the only, you're the only one in the sea of thousands of people, hundreds of people. The Bible says, by faith, Enoch lived differently. By faith, when no one else, when no one else around Enoch, when his family, when the, the culture, but by faith, he was different. And the last thing that, that I really felt like God say to me from Enoch is, you know, when it looks like this all around you, this really stands out to God. And it's easier to please God when no one else is doing it. It's easier to get God's attention. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live a life that no matter what is going on around, no matter what people are doing or saying, no matter the circumstance or the situation, I pray that each of us would have the faith just to do the little things that we know we're called to, to answer the call, that we don't become just like the circumstances and culture around us, that we don't kind of fit into the mold of what's going on around us, that we would be different, that no matter how dry, and how barren the landscape is around us in the spiritual sense, I pray that we would be spiritual flowers that bear fruit. Lord, give us the faith to know that no matter where we go, no matter what work environment, neighborhood, restaurant, no matter what school we walk into, you are there before us, and you have a plan for that place. And you are king and Lord over that place. And when we walk into it, you're already there, that you exist in that space no matter how much it looks like you are. And number two, Lord, that you would, that you reward those who earnestly seek you. So Lord, help us to seek you no matter what it looks like. 
In Jesus' name, amen.